you're looking at a rotating stone, a small lump of basalt. Basalt is a dark, igneous rock, formed from lava flows that cool quickly when they reach the Earth's surface. Basalt is used a lot for construction work because it's very strong and durable. It's also what makes up most of those dark patches on the moon's surface. I'm going to talk about a few things while this rock turns. I'm going to talk about two books, some other rocks, energy drinks, strike action, inanimate matter, contingency, and rubbish. Mostly rubbish. I first met Maud Cotter in real life when I visited her at the National Sculpture Factory in Cork, in what seems like a different eon now, before the pandemic, back in 2019. I was most struck that day by the friendly welcome and enthusiasm and energy of her ideas and her thinking around and beyond her work, but I was also struck by the friendliness and generosity of the work itself. I saw several of her pieces that day, of very different sizes and materials. I was impressed obviously by the bigness of some of these works, but also by the smallness, by the attention to smallness. Not so much uh, the attention to detail, though Maud's works are clearly marked by a masterful precision when it comes to details of form, craft and materials. Rather, what I mean is something to do with paying attention to the ordinary, to the small things of the everyday, to objects and materials that are often neglected, overlooked, discarded. Even my choice of words here, often neglected, reduces a broad heterogeneous range of things, a vast undulating field of differentiated things, to a category, the category of the neglected, and there they may stay. With that generic claim I consign them to further neglect. Maud's work, I think, retrieves some of these things, those objects, materials, substances, matter, from the dustbin of categor categorical neglect. Her works present found objects in unusual combinations and relationships, but this seems to me to go far beyond the technique of defamiliarization. Sometimes they seem to sample a state of contingency that the objects of the world are subject to, but which we have a habit of plastering over with languages and systems of order and causality. Some of her works, my favorite ones, seem to distill moments of unexpected breakdown of those shielding systems of order and rationality that tell us that there is reason behind everything, even randomness. Things that seem so natural, so lacking in artifice in the way that they hang together, in the way that the parts relate to each other, that it feels like Maud may have just happened upon them in the world and reconstructed them in the gallery in the manner of one of those antique buildings that have been disassembled brick by brick and then reassembled on another continent. I am repeatedly drawn back to one piece, Anne Bone, which seems to me to have the contingent certainty of a bunch of things that have been blown by the wind and gotten stuck on a fence, a temporary confluence of debris, a brittle, ephemeral balancing act of stuff that has wound up, clung together for a few moments. Though they are the result of rigorous design, they also demonstrate the fascinating energy of chance connections, contingent organisation of aesthetic properties into a whole. Quite different to surrealist defamiliarization tactics, these puzzling configurations of stuff have the same compelling qualities as other puzzling configurations of stuff that we might see in the world if we look out for them. The same kind of rhythms, patterns of confluence, gatherings of accidentally compatible materials and forms, the same buzz of energy about them, the same incomprehensible significance about them, as if full of meaning that somehow comes about naturally, like a natural resource. The universe as an outsider artist, or the mysticism of matter, as Roger Calois who I'll come to later, would have said. This is a kite stuck in a tree. Not so much a puzzling configuration as one that has a sort of storybook cliché about it. And yet, this combination of stuff in the world 
fascinated both me and my three-year-old son. Too high up to be easily retrieved, it stayed up there for many days. Each time we returned to the spot in the local park, we were glad to see it still there, still billowing in the breeze, still tangled in an angular knot of ribbons and foliage, still visibly articulating the patterns of air flow, still worryingly vulnerable to the weather, still stuck and patently not flying around. A colourful intruder caught in a web of green leaves. An accidental sculpture, as cliched as it might seem at first, this kite stuck in these trees had a peculiar beauty about it. During the rest of this video you will see some other puzzling configurations of stuff in the world that I've collected from the area around where I live in the UK. Some are temporary clusters of things, blown by the wind, discarded haphazardly or knocked over, while others are more clearly the result of intentional human activities that nevertheless seem to exist within an unconsciously constructed system of things and processes. Often happening, I think, as part of a slow accrual of stuff additions, alterations, and decay. When I visited Maud, I had a book in my bag called Energy Dreams by the eco-philosopher Michael Marder, which I pulled out at one point because it seemed relevant to what we were talking about which was energy, ecology, and a certain way of thinking about the world that sees it as a resource to be plundered, that breaks the world down into discrete objects that are there to be used or not used, owned or not owned, kept or discarded. This is the same perspective, perhaps, that imagines economic growth to be potentially infinite and always desirable. We spoke about energy because that seemed to be a primary, formal parameter of the work, and of Maud's practice, the impression of energy contained in, flowing through or from, the object. Beyond a concern for the economic and ecological contexts of what energy means today, it seemed important also to think about how these objects persist within the spaces that they inhabit, within a continuously fluctuating system of forces. There is a misleading stillness, I think, about these works, that belies a continuous exchange between the energy that holds them together and the other things in the room, or as Maud herself articulates it in the interview that we did, they draw upon the orderliness available in the world around them to maintain their internal order. In Energy Dreams, Marder attempts to examine what we mean when we say the word energy. He looks at where this concept comes from, how it has changed quite radically in the last couple of centuries and its significance within contemporary conversations about economics, politics and climate change. My understanding of the word energy was pretty standard, I, I thought. It's a, it's a fairly clear and succinct way of naming that intangible force that seems to flow through everything that moves and acts. Although even as I say it, I feel like my confident grasp is already faltering. Is it a force, really? Do I know what that means? The first law of thermodynamics tells me that energy can't be created or destroyed, only changed from one state into another. Energy is stored up as potential energy, like a coiled up spring that is then released and turned into a different form of energy. Kinetic energy in the twang of a spring as it flies off my table. It's a short jump from this example to the vast pools of chemical energy stored up in underground oil reserves that are eventually turned into kinetic energy in the bellies of cars driving around motorways, taking their drivers to work every morning. Here's another vernacular example of the ideas of energy that many of us share. We get a good night's sleep to recharge our energy, so that we can go and expend it through work or play the following day. We eat a big breakfast to store up more energy for the day, the chemical transformation happening in our bellies. 
The energy in the food is quantifiable as cal calories and joules, transformed into kinetic energy, the actions of arms and legs doing work, making things, running errands, cutting a rug, playing footsie. Energy seems to be something that we can find, that we can store up, and that we can choose to spend in different ways. This applies on a personal level and on a societal level. These assumptions about the storage of energy and its transformation into activity underlie much of the urgent questions we now face about where we get our energy from, how sustainable or renewable these sources are, and how we go about protecting, controlling and distributing access to energy resources across the world. Energy appears to be something that needs to be discovered, unlocked, secured and used up. Energy pervades our dreams of future abundance, wealth and health and feeds our fears of the resource-hungry years that may come. Energy is the basic currency around which a web of political, economic and cultural tensions vibrates. This TV ad for a leading brand of energy drink condenses these orbiting ideas more elegantly than I can. 199, 200! Here it is! The treasure is down there! Start digging! Quicker! Dig quicker! Here! Drink a Red Bull! That's better! Can you see it? How much is there? Hello? Have you found the treasure? Hello? Red Bull gives you wings! The pirates search for treasure buried underground. The captain gives the underling pirate a dose of energy to help him work better, investing some energy in the production of more energy. Consuming the can of energy drink endows the one digging with greater speed and digging power. The energy contained in potential is released through the cracking open of the can and the consumption of the liquid, which visibly invigorates the arms of the underling pirate who digs like crazy. In fact, it seems to have provided an excess of energy. He keeps digging until he comes out the other side of the island and makes off with the treasure. The treasure, we can presume, is gold, a store of value, exchangeable for all sorts of other energies. In fact, according to this logic, energy is value, and the treasure chest may as well be full of more cans of Red Bull. For Martyr, this vision of energy as stored up in objects, in matter, waiting to be discovered and waiting to be released through consumption or disintegration, is a damaging inversion of the original meaning of energy, as was first coined by Aristotle as energia. The contemporary understanding of potential energy implies that energy is in a kind of limbo, waiting to be actualized, not quite there yet. It is present in the object as something that wants to be, that wants to escape, that isn't yet real in the world, but could be if only something or someone would come and release it, unlock it, drag it from the netherworld of potentiality into the real world of actuality. This energy which is locked up in matter seems to always inevitably require some form of violent separation to release it. Coal is mined and then burned. Apples are picked and then eaten. Eggs are cracked, fried and eaten. In this model, as Marda puts it, energy is actualized not in being, but in the decimation of being. Energy drinks are for him a good example of the worst practices of energy management. Aristotle's energy was a little bit more of a mystical property than something that could be measured and calculated in joules or calories. In fact, this original conception of energy was in some ways the opposite of how we now understand it. Energy for Aristotle resides in objects, in matter, not in potential, but in actuality. It doesn't require some sort of violent separation to bring it into being, and it doesn't simply get used up through work, movement or activity. For Marder, reading Aristotle, energy is preserved rather than exhausted through the doing of, of activities, of processes. Energy happens through matter, through processes, through forces interacting. It's an ongoing happening. 
This is also the energy of rest, energy at rest, not understood as languishing in the limbo of potential, but rather as energy that is already present, energy that is already flowing through the object, though the object may not be obviously doing anything. I want to think about stones here, but Martyr gives the example of a strike. Though the kind of strike that he has in mind is the kind that seeks a transformation of work, not just some minor modifications to a contract. It's the kind that seeks justice, not a slightly better pension. So it is a cessation of labour that sees itself as an end of work, an end of productive labour, an end of exploitation of resources, both human and non-human. It is an energy that flows through a mass, but does not exhaust itself in the process. In Sergei Eisenstein's strike, the striking workers are exuberant, exhilarated, ecstatic, persisting in a temporary state of non-work, an undirected, unproductive, wonderfully unproductive manifestation of energy. A strike is energy flowing, happening, actualized, and yet it is by definition the stopping of productive work. The refusal to expend energy in the conventional sense of quantifiable labour time. This might well sound like a, a, lo a load of semantic play, but Marder has definitely identified something about the way that we in the West have come to think about energy. Energy which seems scientific, but actually is a term adopted by science in the 19th century, its meaning altered along the way. Marder demonstrates that energy is an idea that is culturally constructed and comes to mean very different things at different points in history. It also suggests that what some contemporary Western cultures have come to call energy is a means of condensing a wide and disparate range of different things into one thing, potential energy, which infiltrates the dreams, desires and fears of peoples and societies around the world. And arranged around that one thing are a set of wildly exploitative and ecologically and culturally damaging practices that are aimed at releasing and managing potential energy on both an industrial and a personal level. Energy at rest. That's something to think about. Since that visit to the National Sculpture Factory in 2019, another book has come to fascinate me that I think I would have mentioned then if I had read it. It's called The Writing of Stones by Roger Calois. Calois was a French sociologist and literary critic, and he was for a time a member of the Surrealist group, until a disagreement with André Breton and a disagreement with some of the wider tenets of Surrealism led him to leave the group and forge his own path. Calois was a bit too much of a rationalist and a scientist to be a true surrealist. He was interested less in the life of the unconscious than in the proactive power of ritual, of the sacred, of playing games, and of looking very closely at the world around him in a spirit of inquiry. The Writing of Stones is one of the last books that he wrote, and it's concerned with one of his long-running passions, the collecting of interesting stones and rocks. In this lavishly illustrated book, which you can see some images from right now, he provides us with a short history of a peculiar form of art making, which seems to exist somewhere in between geology, the rare gem market, landscape painting and outsider art. This is the market which has existed since at least the 17th century for rocks and minerals that are sought after not for their rarity as minerals, such as a, a ruby or a diamond is valuable simply because it is a ruby or a diamond, but these are more or less common stones that are individually marked by peculiar formations or patterns, random clusterings of particles during the formation of the stones that result in pleasing, interesting or mysterious patterns when it's cut into a cross-section. 
The early popularity of these phenomena focused around stones that seemed to accidentally depict recognisable scenes. Urban scenes with buildings, squares and towers, spires, pastoral landscapes, even human figures in some. There is something of the joke about a thousand monkeys on a thousand typewriters eventually writing Hamlet by accident here. And yet there is something quite different as well, because while Calois is obsessed with these rocks, he himself is a collector, he is at least as much interested in the viewer's capacity to see into these stones, to recognise the scenes in the chaotic patterns, the human tendency to find, interpret and be compelled by the likeness of an image in the world, an event or a figure frozen and hidden within a stone, revealed through a careful cross-sectional cut. Painters in Europe in the 17th century took to adding to these rocks, finding the rudiments of a background, the suggestion of a scene or a location in a rock, and then painting in, on top, human figures or other recognisable elements, in order to turn these natural phenomena into classical scenes. These were collaborations between the chaos of natural mineral formations and the hand and the mind of the artist. Though now diluted by the intentionality of human art, these objects, displayed in wealthy houses and salons, rather highlighted the fault lines and overlaps between the perceived specialness and sanctity of human creativity and intentionality and originality and the brute, insensate randomness of the mineral formations in the rocks. The popularity of these pieces in China during the same period and after takes a slightly different approach. Indeed, it adopts a somewhat different stance toward these objects and their status as artworks in relation to the artist. As Calwar reports, many Chinese artists believed it sufficient for them to identify a peculiar, peculiarly artful formation or pat patterning in a rock. They would cut it out, mount it and sign it, as if their achievement was in simply being able to see the aesthetic value in the rock and bring it to the viewer's attention. But it's the third category of curious stones that Calwa is particularly interested in, and it's these that he primarily collects himself. These are the stones that do not depict anything recognisable as being landscapes, figures or images of the world. These are the rock images that seem to parallel, and yet of course precede by many millennia, the emergence of abstraction in painting in the 20th century. This is what really fires Calois' imagination. These are the stones that he's really drawn to above all others, those that, those that do not offer an easy interpretation, a surprising likeness or figure or landscape. These are the images that seem to emerge from some brand of chaotic design, expressive and abstract, shading close to meaning, but never quite settling into any, into any legible form. Calwa writes, trying to describe what he sees in one of these rocks, They form patterns which explode, showers of many-sided cells, sprays of dodecahedra all on one plane, Irregular veins branching out in all directions, then suddenly tapering away. Steel yards weighing a large object, which is yet so light that the arm of the balance is unmoved. Cobwebs spun in the void, attached to no point and containing no lurking spider. Cross sections of murexes, with the helix in the middle and the spines on the outside. The waving tentacles of sea anemones, the filaments of jellyfish, jellyfish ending in a whiplash. Calois seems to be writing with his tongue a little bit in his cheek. His descriptive flourishes are so specific and wild in their free associative cataloguing of dynamic shapes, figures and forces that they seem to admit to the flight of fancy of the author. These are his interpretations of the abstract swirls and spikes and constellations on the surface of the stone cross-section. And indeed his descriptions do seem to contain more than a hint of abstract energies playing out across the surface of the stone, which is really the frozen interior of a stone object. And again from Calois he writes, Out of the dark of the stone, between the beams of an incandescent star, shine bright streaks and points like dandelion seeds blown from the stem, fixed in their flight and forming a kind of halo around the original centre. Such specimens always exhibit a geometry that is both 
capricious and harmonious, airily combining rigor and ease. And it's that line, airily combining rigor and ease, that reminds me of, and brings me back to, Maud's work, which somehow straddles this line between the automatic aesthetics of chaotic nature and the careful, attentive construction of the artist, a really delicate balance that is somehow pulled off, airily combining rigor and ease. To conclude, there is something about the mystery of these stones that is the same as the mysterious qualities of a good photograph, which makes me wonder what André Bazin or Roland Barthes would have made of these stones. Something about the automatic creation of these images that seem to offer themselves to be read to legibility that is similar to the way that Bazin talks about the peculiar quality of the camera being the fact that it partially removes the hand of the human artist from the equation. However, as much as I am compelled and surprised by Calois' attention to this peculiar history of art, and the way that he draws out something about what he calls the mysticism of matter, the, fac the facility of the world to automatically arrange itself into images that have meaning for some humans, artworks that conceivably pre-exist the human cultural practices and discourses of art making, I am also left a little disappointed. I am disappointed that Calois himself narrows the field of interest down to this special stone, these unique, rare examples, these outliers in the world of stones. I have always had a peculiar fascination with ordinary stones, just any old lump of basalt or other rock looked at up close, which provide an apparently endless depth of detail to engage with. It's a matter of framing, I think, because the wealth of ordinary but interesting stones out there to be engaged with is too great. That way lies madness. And in any case, it seems quite an indulgence to even talk about such fancies when there is so much else at stake, so many other urgencies that we must turn our energies toward. But to categorically dispense with them, to consign them to the dustbin of neglect, as it were, simply because they are too many in number, seems to me to be also a great shame, a great loss. There is quite a lot of entertainment, even understanding, to be gleaned from an evening contemplating a good stone. <laughs>